Okay. Yes, fine. Perfect. Okay, so welcome everybody. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Shona Mortier. Um, I'm based at Development Studies at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and I also direct the Center for Civil Society. Today, I'm so thrilled to be introducing two colleagues from Civicus, the Global Civil Society Alliance, and we are having two seminars in collaboration with them, and the two seminars are all about civil society. Today, our two speakers are David Code, who is the Advocacy and Campaigns Lead for Civicus. Um, so David's area of research is the civic space. He's interested in democracy, he's interested in elections and civil society in Africa. Um, and his colleague who is co-presenting with him is Ines Posadella, who is a research specialist at Civicus but she is a political scientist by training, and she also still lectures at the university, I, I hope I get this right, um, Universidad ORT in Montevideo, Uruguay. So welcome to David and Ines, we're so thrilled to have you today. The topic of the seminar is basically drawing from the findings of the 2021 Civicus Report, which looks at the state of civil society. So this report is published every year and we're going to be focusing on the 2021 report. Um, it's basically looking at events and trends that impact on civil society, how civil society responds to major issues and problems of the day. Um, and it draws from in-depth interviews and online consultations with civil society organizations, leaders, experts, as well as activists and others that are close to the stories of the year. And the focus of this report, some of the themes that are going to be drawn out in today's seminar that came up in the report are the global struggle for racial justice. So we all saw the incredible rise of Black Lives Matter movement last year, even though the movement's been around for a while. Challenging exclusion and claiming rights, demands for economic justice, demands for environmental justice, um, and democracy under the pandemic, some of the issues that came up around the lockdown, around uh, the COVID challenges and the way that it highlighted the inequality, global inequality. And I'm going to turn over now to Andres, who's going to be facilitating the seminar. But once again, welcome to our speakers and I'm so thrilled to have you join us. And this, as I said, this is one of two seminars. There's another seminar with our Civicus colleagues next week, but we'll tell you a bit more about that at the end of the seminar. So I'm handing over to you, Andres, to you're going to facilitate today. Thank you, David and Ines. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Shona, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andres Motau. I'm a researcher at the Center for Social Society, as well as a PhD student, uh, David and Ernest, uh, you will give you about 40 minutes uh, for you to do your presentation. Then after we'll take question and, uh, questions from the audience. If there are those that want to, they can't keep their questions, they can post them in the chat bar. And for the remainder of this, while David and Ernest are presenting, I would prefer that everyone remains muted and their videos are off. Uh, Ernest and David, over to you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, it's our pleasure to be here, and um, I will um, I will share my screen and um, uh, share a presentation uh, with you. Our intention is to provide an overview of the contents of the report uh, and 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 provide some examples, case studies from Southern Africa specifically, and then um, leave as much time as possible for conversation. Uh, about the trends uh, that we are seeing um, in the long term uh, that are all reflected in, in the events of last year and the way civil society has responded to them. So let me uh, just um, start by sharing my uh, screen. Do you see it? Just to confirm. Yes. Okay, great. So, um, as already said in the wonderful introduction that we had, um, our State of Civil Society report is published every year. 
And this is our 10th edition of the report. Um, so besides looking as usual back one year to find uh, what uh, uh, were the main challenges for civil society and how civil society responded to them, we are also looking at the whole decade that passed and identifying longer term trends uh, as a way to start thinking about uh, the future, about how civil society needs to reorganize itself and how it can face uh, the challenges of the next decade. So uh, one important thing that has already been said, actually, is that our report seeks to capture the voices of civil society. So it's made uh, in consultation uh, with um, our partners, our members, civil society activists on the ground, leaders, experts, uh, and uh, their voices are reflected through interviews uh, and other kinds of consultations. This past year, mostly webinars, uh, because we have engaged online only, but uh, typically uh, there's more face-to-face um, uh, -face interactions as well. So uh, as, uh, um, in order to provide a, a little taste of what the report is about, I will uh, share a one minute video with you, and then we'll start uh, talking about the contents of the different chapters. So. As, as you as you could see, um, this this report uh, looks back um, on a very unusual year uh, that was uh, marked by a crisis um, that's still ongoing, uh, unprecedented in our memory. Um, but uh, so it 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 makes seem, see, it seem that everything was so unusual and so strange. But at the same time, uh, what we are seeing over and over is that this crisis uh, patterned uh, onto existing social fault lines and deepened them and made them more apparent um, that under uh, the pandemic, um, I mean, the pandemic provided the cover for continued civic space restrictions, affected uh, the already most excluded the most. Um, so um, there, there is always a temptation to write a report about the pandemic, uh, but we actually did that last year. And uh, this report is not about the pandemic. It's about uh, everything that happened uh, uh, against the backdrop of the pandemic, everything that we achieved in a context uh, made much worse by the pandemic. So uh, the report uh, covers five key areas uh, of civil society action during 2020. The first one of which is um, covered in the first chapter that um, yields a reflection that cuts through the whole report. Uh, basically, civil society's effectiveness uh, in making the invisible best visible, changing the conversation, setting the agenda, uh, and the fact that mobilization actually works. This is something that we're going to see uh, throughout the report. Um, chapter one is about the global struggle for racial justice. Uh, it tells the story of how the murder of George Floyd unleashed a wave of anger across the US, but also around the world. It follows this wave from country to country, 
as people adopted the Black Lives Matter motto and also resignified it to speak up about their own lifetime experience, experiences uh, of struggle uh, and uh, the ongoing uh, realities of racism in their own context. And these um, newly mobilized energies um, connected with uh, decades old struggles that were already ongoing in many contexts. So protests mobilized in every continent from Brazil, Colombia, the Dominican Republic, in the Americas, uh, to the UK, the Netherlands, uh, in Europe, and also, of course, uh, Nigeria, South Africa. Um, the, we, we even saw Black Lives Matter uh, um, uh, or protests in Japan and in places where it, <laughs> you wouldn't expect them. So uh, this movement shifted public discourse away from a discussion about uh, racial discrimination as a problem of individual attitudes and shifted it towards the recognition of systemic racism, focusing attention on the political, economic and social structures that uh, tend to perpetuate uh, white supremacy and enable police brutality. And it has to be said in some contexts, the protests were about police brutality alone. Uh, movements uh, for Black lives and Black uh, rights won impacts and recognition that this change needs to happen. And also, of course, encountered pushback and often repression uh, that uh, brought uh, 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 further st st state violence against protesters that were protesting state violence. Um, and, uh, and of course, it also unleashed uh, uh, one of the forces that we've been seeing throughout these 10 years of coverage, uh, which are the anti-rights uh, forces, not necessarily state actors, but only non-state actors mobilized against progressive rights-oriented civil society. David? Yeah, thank you so much, Ines. And I'll just shed a bit of light on, on what the report captures on South Africa and, and three to four uh, significant issues that are prominent that would like to, 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 to raise and highlight, uh, particularly as we speak about the internationalization of the BLM uh, protest. We could see similar protests in South Africa uh, partly because um, of the history of police brutality in, in South Africa, of the history of inequality and the struggle for uh, black emancipation. And so it was no surprise that we had similar BLM protests, um, you know, in a country like South Africa. But what the report highlights, which is, I think, significant uh, to our audience, is that on the 3rd of June, uh, protests were held in front of the parliament in Cape Town uh, in solidarity with the protests that were taking place in the United States, but also because at the time, a few months uh, after the sh national shutdown, uh, Collins Causa, a black South African, had been killed as security forces were enforcing um, uh, restrictions uh, in the streets of, 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 of Johannesburg and, and other city. One other significant uh, event or issue that the report highlights as far as protests against police brutality and inequality are concerned in relation to, to, in relation to BLM is that by uh, the end of June, 11 people had been killed as security forces enforced a national shutdown. Uh, we saw at the beginning of the shutdown, uh, the president declaring war on the pandemic. He appeared in military gear surrounded by his generals. And, and while as um, a community of human beings, we were all in favor of, of waging war of the pandemic, the effect on black people, particularly the poor, uh, made some to kind of conclude that this was actually a war against uh, the people as opposed to the pandemic. Again, without taking the seriousness of the pandemic and the drastic measures that needed to be put in place, you know, to ensure that we all emerge out of the pandemic with as few casualties as possible. By the end of June, 11 people had died uh, as a result of police actions as they tried to enforce the restrictions that had been put in place by the president. And, the, and that number is quite significant because across the world, uh, South Africa stood out as one of the countries that um, where, you know, 11 people had been killed 
uh, in direct relation to uh, efforts by the security forces to ensure that uh, social distancing rules were, were implemented. We also noticed, and the report states this uh, specifically, that when you looked at the dynamics of protests um, last year, uh, you could realize that, or you would realize that, a, the protests that were led by predominantly uh, Black individuals uh, um, it you know elicited uh, a, a harsher response from the police as opposed to protest you know at beaches or you know calling for people re to return to the beaches that had a predominantly white uh, audience so that was quite significant and of course lastly on this particular point we saw a resurgence of uh, you know protests against um, apartheid or colonial uh, institutions, uh, colonial uh, artifacts and, and symbols that really reminded communities of the uh, excesses of, of apartheid, but also of colonialism. So what we realized, we noticed last year as well was while the Black Lives Matter protests were taking place, we could see the, um, you know, um, the statute of, of Paul Kruger being defaced and other protests happening around, you know, uh, symbols that reminded people of the effect of colonialism. Thanks. Back to you, Ines. Thank you, David. So um, you, you're going to start seeing some trends that cut through the whole report. And one of them has to do with the character of, um, of restrictions on civic space restrictions and also, of course, pandemic uh, restrictions that in many cases they were used, instrumentalized as, uh, as uh, civic space restrictions. So chapter two is about uh, struggles for rights. And it focuses on certain excluded groups, such as women, LGBTQI plus people, and migrants and refugees, who were coincidentally those that were impacted first and worst by the pandemic and uh, the lockdowns uh, declared in response to the pandemic. So uh, as in the protest that uh, David just mentioned, um, here we also see you know, a changing face uh, of civil society. It's people from the affected groups uh, speaking up for themselves, um, often very young people mobilized, uh, often women at the forefront of protests. Uh, it's um, this shift towards grassroots uh, civil society and social movement expression. So um, uh, what, we, what we see in this chapter is that uh, as the pandemic hit, uh, it hit uh, disproportionately on those already facing discrimination, violence, rights violations. So their struggles to end uh, these violence, discrimination, rights violations became uh, more urgent. And they continued under the pandemic. Uh, so in response both to the effects of the pandemic and to the longer term trends of exclusion. Uh, so uh, in very difficult context uh, marked by restrictions of, of to movement, uh, to gatherings, uh, campaigns mobilized to call the attention to very urgent problems uh, such as gender-based violence, which actually became a pandemic on its own, uh, the continued denial of sexual and reproductive rights and the politicization of uh, homophobia and xenophobia. Um, and uh, we also saw, and this is quite uh, striking in the context of the pandemic, we also saw the conclusion uh, and breakthroughs uh, in very long-term struggles, struggles that had taken decades, um, including uh, the legalization of abortion in Argentina and in New Zealand, the recognition of same-sex marriage uh, in Costa Rica, the decriminalization of same-sex same uh, relations in Bhutan and Gabon, uh, we saw that in the video. And so uh, we basically see uh, in many places uh, the way um, longer term advocacy and campaigning uh, are, um, uh, you know, receive, uh, so achieve uh, results and, 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 and gain victories. So these, uh, these gains, um, not surprisingly, brought a very hostile reactions. Uh, so uh, this took the form of harassment, threats, violence. And so it again pointed to the reality of uh, the fragility of rights, the need to guard rights even while we push further, and particularly to face uh, organized anti-rights groups that are increasingly active, both at the national, regional um, and global levels. Uh, Thank you. 
Thank you, Ines. Uh, again, uh, to shed a bit of light on Namibia, uh, which is uh, in the neighborhood, uh, we want to highlight this case particularly, and, and maybe just to say we are summarizing our cases as much as possible because we can't present all cases. And, and this is Namibia, which is next door to South Africa. At the time when uh, young people took to the streets on that, they shut it all down. Uh, hashtag against, um, you know, to highlight the threats and the violence against women and children in Namibia. It was reported that 200 cases of gender-based violence are, are filed with the police and with the authorities each month in, in Namibia. Uh, in the few months before um, the, the, the protest, uh, 1,600 cases of rape had been reported uh, to the police uh, before June 2020. And, and so again, these protests were unique in Namibia because uh, Namibians are not, um, known to take to the streets at each and every time. And again, it's one country where, uh, you know, from regional institutions like the African Union, the African Commission, and even global institutions like the United Nations Human Rights Council, you don't get Namibia future extensively uh, like other neighboring countries in SADC because it's seen as uh, one of the more stable, uh, you know, democracies in, in, in the region. But this protest highlighted the scourge of gender-based violence. They highlighted how police would respond to a protest organized primarily by youth. And that was the first response by security forces um, who used violence and basically dispersed the protests that were just highlighting uh, the cases of, of rape and gender-based violence. But despite the, 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 the high statistics, you know, uh, 200 cases of gender-based violence being reported every month, uh, you know, 1,600 cases of rape reported over a, a, a short period of time, it had to take the uh, disappearance of uh, Dalike Ashanon, uh, a young, uh, you know, 22 year old who, uh, you know, uh, was nowhere to be found. And then, you know, when, when, when the news made national headlines and the protests happened, that was when, you know, the country came together to really highlight the scourge uh, that, you know, um, you know um, is placed in, 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 in a country that is seen as, as a democracy. So again, like I said, it had to take this one particular case for this movement to build up. And it's a first uh, uh, um, in, in, in Namibia, and we hope that we'll, we'll, we're likely to see uh, these kinds of mobilizations, particularly when institutions are failing to do uh, what they're supposed to do. And despite the violence and despite the, the, the reprisal of the protests, uh, I think the message was very clear. And, and, and we also, um, you know, concede that uh, there were conversations between the president of Namibia and some of the protesters and, and, and calls and acknowledgements by the authorities to start implementing some policies that would include a registrar for, you know, those who are, you know, accused or found guilty of rape. Uh, and these are small steps that we hope will build into uh, a more systemic response to uh, gender-based violence and, and, and rape in, in, in Namibia, in a country that is basically silent uh, when it comes to having these conversations at regional and international forums. Back to you, Ines. Thank you. So, um, you see, this is not a report about protests. <laughs> it is a report about civil society action. And it, of course, it covers a lot uh, of other things uh, besides protests, like, you know, litigation or uh, building solidarity and campaigning and um, um, delivering services in response to the pandemic and lots of things. But uh, the thing is, when we do, we're, we're doing this survey, uh, we found a lot of mobilization in a context where that wasn't particularly conducive to mobilization. Uh, we found that uh, in this year of the pandemic, people still protested however they could. Uh, most of the year's protests uh, came as people responded to the impacts of the emergency measures on their ability to meet essential needs. Uh, we saw people in country after country in every single continent uh, 
who live, people who were living um, precariously, who, who had trouble, uh, were struggling to uh, make ends meet, uh, who were um, in, in, in poverty, um, and, and who were, whose situation was made much worse by the uh, economic impacts of the pandemic and the lockdowns. Uh, to demand uh, better support from their governments and, of course, to highlight corruption, because that was the time when the effects of corruption were made more apparent, when people realized that uh, whatever was uh, ending up in the wrong pockets was something that they were uh, not receiving, right? So uh, it, it is in situations like this when uh, um, uh, protest against um, uh, austerity measures, protest against uh, lack of social um, uh, support, so social networks, also becomes a, a protest against corruption. Uh, so for, for many people, um, economic uh, um, disruption also um, uh, took them to recognize um, the more structural um, character of, of the problems, the, the fact that economic structures were flawed. And so people started uh, also um, resisting plans uh, to restart the economies in ways that would uh, impact uh, the poorest the worst, right? Um, and uh, ways to restart, easy ways to restart economies that would basically do very little to challenge uh, elite wealth and privilege. Uh, so uh, the, the, the consequences of the uh, current economic models were confronted every time people resisted uh, this austerity policies, but also environmentally devastating development projects and insisted that climate change uh, must come before, you know, business as usual. And, and that's one of the things that we also saw in the, it, it, that, that uh, in a year that was expected to be the year of climate action, but it wasn't because it was the year of the pandemic, uh, climate activists continue to mobilize uh, also to uh, make sure that um, um, climate change wouldn't take the backseat on the road to recovery. Um, so uh, in, in this case, we don't have you know, specific case studies in the sense that they are not very different from what we found everywhere in every single continent, in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa. What we see is a lot of protests about um, uh, climate, about uh, environmental impact of economic activity, and also against uh, economic um, uh, austerity measures, lack of uh, social um, assistance uh, to the most vulnerable, and corruption. Um, and then, uh, we're just moving on to the next chapter, uh, which uh, touches on a very core issue that uh, pertains to our work uh, as uh, a global alliance of uh, progressive rights-oriented civil society, which is the state of democracy under the pandemic. And um, what, we've, uh, what we've seen when looking at the past year is that attacks on democratic freedoms uh, accelerated under the pandemic. So this is again a longer ter term trend of um, democratic uh, backsliding, uh, but uh, we saw that everywhere um, states, not all of them, but many states took the opportunity to bring in restrictions that were not required to fight the virus, but extended state powers and reduced uh, space for accountability and dissent. Uh, so, um, and we see it in, in, in different ways, uh, but of course, one of the things we focus on is elections. Uh, there were many elections over the year, uh, which um, some of them offered opportunities to express dissent and to demand uh, change. Uh, and there were some rare uh, cases uh, where uh, governments changed hands. Um, uh, for example, uh, we saw that in the Dominican Republic. Uh, but, um, and, and of course, uh, we saw change coming after civil society, civil society forced uh, a rerun of a flawed election in Malawi. We saw that in a couple more places. We saw uh, a, a few countries where a good pandemic response was um, uh, rewarded uh, and incumbents uh, won re-election. Uh, we saw that specifically in New Zealand and in South Korea. But then, uh, unfortunately, too many elections offered only uh, an empty ritual, um, you know, of democracy that was not uh, real. They, they confirmed a long-running presidential power. We saw that in Belarus, Uganda, and lots of 
uh, uh, countries in, in West Africa specifically, uh, we saw how uh, the pandemic um, fueled the divisive and polarizing far-right politics, uh, which were at some, at, up to some point and in this, the decisive moment, they were resisted in the USA, for example, uh, with, uh, when, when Donald Trump wasn't re-elected, but um, it continued pushing across Europe, including in Poland, Serbia, Slovenia. Uh, so uh, we saw um, um, different, very different situations in, in places where people uh, resisted repressive states to demand democracy, uh, such as in Myanmar and Thailand, and and uh, and we saw in other places civil society working to actually keep um, democracy alive. Um, up to you, David. Thanks, thanks, Ines. I think I'll very quickly the one major lesson captured by the report uh, for SADC, but also for Africa, uh, uh, is that at a time when. Um, certain countries used, like my colleague in it said, the pandemic to either hold elections very quickly. I mean, in uh, Niger and Guinea, uh, sorry, in Guinea and, and, and Togo, elections were quickly held, um, you know, under the guise of the pandemic, you know, when people were wondering, should we go out or should we adhere to social distancing? Uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, which was, um, seen as one of the emerging democracies in the West African region after decades of, 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 of uh, civil war, the president amended the constitution and um, you know, decided to hang on to power uh, in Uganda uh, prior to elections. The opposition was not allowed to assemble in certain areas while the ruling party had uh, you know, rallies, um, you know, in the midst of the pandemic. But we saw a combination of an independent judiciary and um, the resilience of civil society in Malawi, which, was, which is a first in, in Africa, actually, where um, the court overturned the results of the May 2019 election. Uh, civil society groups were on the streets protesting for, uh, calling for a rerun of the election and the, the elections were eventually organized. And, and now we have a new government that is seen to uh, be implementing certain policies that target corruption and also that, you know, include some of the promises, the promises that were made uh, ahead of the elections. I think we'll have a few minutes to discuss, uh, you know, some, you know, what does this mean for civil society and others? But I think for Malawi, our main concern is when you look at uh, a year ago or two years ago when we celebrated the transition in Ethiopia, the transition in the Gambia after decades of dictatorial rule um, and, and what we ex celebrated as well in Cote d'Ivoire. And two years, three years, four years down the line, these countries are back to where they were four years ago. The same repressive tactics, the same undemocratic tactics. I guess for us as civil society, how can we learn lessons from the Gambia, the Ethiopia and Cote d'Ivoire and apply them to Malawi and support civil society to not only hold the democratic space that has been created. If we look across the, the, the neighborhood in Zambia, uh, things are getting really difficult there. So how do we ensure that the democratic space is held but also maintained and sustained for a longer period of time? Back to you, Ines. Thank you, David. Um, well, I don't know what, this is not moving. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, our last chapter um, is um, about um, uh, civil society action at the global level in the international arena. And um, this is particularly uh, a particularly interesting year to look at how um, uh, international cooperation fared. And of course, um, unfortunately, what we find is that uh, when, when the pandemic uh, put all of our institutions to a test, you know, both national uh, and international institutions, it tested our practices of international cooperation and most of them were found lacking. Uh, when, when we needed uh, international cooperation the most uh, what, uh, and we needed a people's vaccine, what we got was uh, vaccine nationalism um, and, and, and all kinds of uh, competitive practices that were uh, that threatened to slow recovery 
and 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 uh, and pattern uh, you know vaccine acquisition um, onto existing um, inequalities. Uh, so intensify global inequalities and and basically uh, leading us to a world where every everybody is uh, unsafe right because of course we we won't all be safe until everybody is so um uh, we we saw uh, some states uh, notably uh, china and russia who are bringing up their their models to the international uh, uh stage uh, we saw them uh, take advantage of, of the situation to uh, ignore international agreements and um, human rights norms. Uh, and so uh, what we what we analyze in this chapter specifically is the efforts that civil society has continued to make to democratize the international system, to bring it in the voices of, of the people, specifically uh, on the 75th anniversary of the United Nations calling up um, for institutional, international institutions to open up to people's participation. And, but of course, I mean, as it was a year of the pandemic, one of our, fo uh, some of our focus went to um, uh, international efforts to uh, democratize access uh, to vaccines. And uh, what, it, what we saw is not very encouraging. Uh, uh, we, we saw how, how, how the discussions uh, at the World Trade Organization negotiations in late uh, 2020 and early 2021, uh, how they ended up uh, with uh, representatives of rich countries, including, the, including members of the European Union and the UK and the US, uh, blocked a proposal from uh, India and South Africa to suspend international intellectual property rules re regarding uh, COVID uh, vaccines and treatments, which would have enabled more rapid um, production of vaccines in the global south, but of course uh, reach states uh, in which uh, the uh, giant uh, pharmaceutical companies are based. Um, Considered this was against their interest, uh, the interest of those companies particularly, and um, and resorted to the same argument that uh, had you they had used uh, for decades um, to uh, sort of squash the movement uh, on affordable HIV, HIV uh, AIDS uh, treatments. Uh, basically, with the argument that uh, that would not uh, that would uh, disincentivize. Um, uh, innovation in pharmaceutics. Uh, so uh, basically, um, this is uh, where we stand, and uh, we. Uh, I, I will invite you to um, to look at the report, and uh, maybe to have a conversation about uh, the uh, trends that uh, we can we can extract from this report regarding um, civic space, regarding the state of democracy, regarding civil society actions and, and the trends in civil society actions, the new forms of civil society, the new actors that are emerging and uh, the effectiveness of, uh, of their actions. Thank you very much and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Ines and David, uh, for the great presentation and for taking us across the globe on what has happened. I must say it's a very interesting report. Um, yeah, and I have a few questions for you. So I'll start with the three questions which I will pose to the two of you. But then before I start with the question, I see Shona has raised her hand. Maybe we should just uh, take a question from her, then I'll, re I'll ask the questions after. Shona. Thanks so much, Andres. Um, thank you, Ines, and thank you, David. Just to say, I really like the way you did that um, presentation with the overview from the themes and then David drawing from them to um, focus on Africa. I thought that was really beautifully done. Thank you. I just have some questions about whether you uh, detected any trends with changes in tactics, because some of the activists I've talked to have said, obviously, they had to adjust their tactics. So one of the ways that they adjusted was to move online. But obviously, this dilutes, for example, holding people accountable. How do you do that online as opposed to marching to their offices or on the court steps or making yourself visible in ways that you couldn't during a lockdown? Um, another emerging trend in South Africa was the community action um, networks and some of the criticisms around those were that there are already existing community networks 
um, that should have been utilized and, and what, what is it about those networks that they weren't visible enough or that they weren't resorted to and that new ones had to be set up. So I'm just wanting to know if, if you observed any other trends um, in terms of a change of tactics that may well carry on post pandemic. And then I have some other questions too, but I don't want to abuse the space of this time later, Andres. Thank you. All right, thank you, Shona. David and Ina, maybe you can answer. Uh, okay, so, so yeah, I, I can um, I can say a few things about what we've seen regarding uh, protests and tactics. Uh, so um, yeah, of course, I mean the first thing we saw with the pandemic is uh, civil society generally, not necessarily not not only you know protests, but uh, taking uh, their activities uh, as many of the activities uh, that could be done online, taking them online. Uh, so that was the first first uh, immediate response to the pandemic. Uh, but also there were uh, further adaptations, I would say. Uh, there, there is, it is rare to see um, uh, protests and mobilization happening uh, only online, you know? I mean, there are online forms of protest, but mostly uh, online, you know, the internet and, and social media, they are used not just to uh, do online, to stage online protests. Uh, use it, they are not just used as a scene for protest, but also as a tool for real life protests, right? Uh, to very quickly organize and be out there in the streets. Uh, and what we saw during the pandemic is that uh, there was a combination of these, but, uh, but street protests uh, never stopped. So um, how, how did, uh, but, but it did change uh, because uh, one, one thing is, um, um, for example, instead of uh, mass, massive protests, uh, there were some kinds of, uh, you know, more um, sort of uh, creative and performative protests uh, became more, more, more common. Uh, with uh, groups staging their very small protests, uh, um, but very carefully staged protests um, uh, as performances in the streets and uh, recording them and, and multiplying them, you know, just disseminating them online. Uh, so these were not online protests, but you know they were disseminated online, and and then the the, the idea of what the, who the audience is to the protest also changed, right? Because those protests were also you know, targeted at an international audience, and 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 some of the pro these protests became viral, and they they started being repeated in in many other countries, uh, such as you know that happened with the feminist protest in in Chile, for example. Um, so, um, and there's also a lot of examples of decentralized protests. I mean, people still protesting in small groups, uh, many small groups at the, at the same time, uh, socially distanced protests and, and, uh, and, and sort of creative uh, uh, ways of, uh, of, of continuing to protest uh, under pandemic rules, respecting the rules of, you know, the pandemic. So, um, I think the adaptation went uh, a lot um, beyond just uh, taking things online. Uh, and maybe David has something else to say about it. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, Ines. Not really, um, maybe to come on the issue of uh, networks and, and why a protest has found it necessary to engage with or form new networks. I think it's, it's a long going conversation around some of the formal structures of civil society that's used to a particular way of working. And now you have protests that emerge uh, almost instantaneously and they are able to galvanize, you know, thousands or even millions of people without necessarily going through the formal structures which uh, formal organizations and even formal networks that used to work with communities uh, uh, have to go through. So it's it's quite interesting and it's a conversation we've been having at Civicus on how we can engage directly with the people, how we can reach out to communities that are most at risk and how we can do less with um, or kind of break the internal structures that have created, you know, formal ways in which we engage either through meetings or um, bringing people together that really takes a lot of time. And what we are seeing with 
almost all the protests that you know are happening these days is that they are actually bypassing some of these formal structures. So it's a question for us at civil, as civil society to introspect, speak with our donors, speak with our communities, uh, and uh, otherwise, you know, the formal structures will increasingly be, be bypassed because uh, protests now are more fluid, people are more eager to get to the streets based on the issues that affect them. And there's no time to really have meetings and discuss, you know, what log frames are, or if this pertains to a particular activity that will speak to some of our, our donor requirements. So if we don't have these conversations extensively on how we engage directly with the people, with the communities who are the forefront of this, um, some of these human rights violations, we'll see increasingly how formal structures like ours would be bypassed as evidenced uh, during the pandemic. It, just just uh, to add something, you know, I, I was thinking it, it's a little bit difficult to, to make a difference between the innovations that we are seeing in protest uh, and mobilization that came in response to the pandemic and those that came in response to repression, because we are also seeing a lot of innovation coming in contexts where uh, the right to protest is, is very uh, repressed uh, and it has been for a long time. So some of the, for example, decentralized protests uh, we saw in Hong Kong, and that, that was, I mean, that was very useful in, in pandemic context, but it was also very useful to avoid detection and repression. So yeah, it, it's a little bit difficult to understand, but we are definitely seeing lots of innovation. No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ines and David. I see uh, Desiree has posed a, a question that, that she um, she uses the report for her master's module that uh, she's teaching uh, civil society and public policy. Is the report uh, already available online? And all, as well, Kugan asked the question that at the height of the pandemic, uh, the United States, uh, the United Nations Secretary General spoke about a new normal a year ago. How can civil society be more empowered to realize this? I think, yeah, I'll take that question and I'll give you, I'll raise other questions after. Sorry, I didn't understand. I didn't hear the, the second question very well. Uh, the question is, how, um, at the height of the pandemic, the United uh, Nations Secretary General spoke about a new normal a year ago. How can civil society be more empowered to realize this? Okay, so uh, I, th that's one thing that uh, we, in civil society, we've been discussing for quite a long time. Since, since we heard that phrase, the new normal, for the first time, we were quite wary of, you know, what the new normal would look like and what it would mean uh, to go back to normal. And, 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 and throughout civil society, the idea of going back, uh, of course, I mean, has been uh, outrightly rejected. The idea is that whatever the new normal is, it needs to be sort of a leap forward. And, and because and, and that's why civil society, you know, while while focusing on uh, emergency relief, which uh, many organizations with, with that that were not going, doing that kind of work started doing under the pandemic. But while doing that, uh, it, it had to sort of sit down and think and discuss, you know, what uh, uh, what the strategy to get us out of this uh, should be like, and and how to avoid uh, falling back into the same old routines that actually took us here. You know that that made this pandemic have the impact that it actually had, right? So that is a discussion that I mean I don't I cannot provide the answer because I am I'm I'm not the one to decide what what it should look like, but it's definitely a, a discussion that civil society is having and 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 much of the effort I would say you know in in litigation in uh, advocacy and campaigning has to do with forcing our respective states. Uh, to not fall back uh, into the old routines. It, it is re related uh, to social protections, uh, you know, to economic models, like social protections, uh, and, uh, and also, well, I mean, labor protections, and also uh, climate, right? So how, uh, how to avoid the temptation uh, 
to quick, you know, kickstart the recovery by um, uh, abusing <laughs> fossil fuels, go, you know, doing the, the, the quick, easy way. So, so that's that's where uh, you know the climate movement that was so active in 2019 needs to basically step up and make sure that doesn't happen. So, yeah, um, I don't know, um, David, <laughs> if you want to come in here. I think that's that's fair enough from my side. I'm happy to take the next one. Um, yeah, the next one is on a comment on civil society in South Africa and uh, is, was this uh, a trend in other places? So the comment is in South Africa, there was no consultation with civil society organizations when the lockdown regulations were drawn up. That's not considering the impact it would have on different sectors of society and thinking through appropriate mitigation measures. NGOs, uh, NGOs later reported the impact on various sectors, e.g. domestic workers and smallholder farmers and the informal sector. Um, was this a trend in other places? Was civil society in other areas where you work or where you have done your research, where the approach similar? Yeah, thanks, Andres, and thanks, Desiree, for the you know, very important question. I think the one of the reasons why you saw a lot of people, um, uh, I, I read the comment uh, a few weeks ago that says people are not going to protest because they are not aware of the dangers of physical protest in the in the midst of a pandemic. They are protesting because they really have no other options, and and this. A question is not just um, related to the South African context. Even in established democracies across the world, uh, there were very few consultations, if any, between governments and civil society, particularly with grassroots communities uh, who would bear the brunt of the pandemic. So uh, as we saw in South Africa, uh, the examples cut across Africa and other countries where uh, people were told at very short notice that there will be shutdowns. In fact, we have released a few other reports that speak to the fact that some governments use the pandemic as a pretext to clamp down on certain rights, as a pretext to advance certain political uh, goals and ambitions. So there were very few consultations. Um, once the uh, in, in, in March last year, Civicus was having a series of meetings with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, even regional institutions. They spoke with governments, government spoke, governments spoke with banks, governments spoke with financial institutions, governments spoke with each other, but they did not really speak with civil society. So it's easy for somebody living in maybe Santin in Johannesburg to stock up their home uh, when the government announces that there is a uh, lockdown looming and, and go to their fridges every morning to, 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 you know, to get their snacks or whatever they need. But for somebody living you know, in some of the informal settlements, uh, we got a lot of uh, co uh, concerns from across Africa where people basically said, we, our livelihoods depend on us going out to you know, to sell in our informal markets. Our livelihoods depend on us going out to work in our farms, but we've been, uh, you know, um, you know, but policies have been imposed that do not really take into account, you know, the daily needs of the poor, the daily needs of those who are marginalized. And so we saw the effect of that kind of harsh decisions that did not really involve consultations with, with civil society. Till date, um, uh, you know, informal workers, till date, uh, domestic workers are still bearing the brunt of the pandemic because not only were there no consultations, but no adequate policies were put in place or resources to ensure that, um, you know, the, the, the sources of income that will be taken away because of shutdowns and because of the effect of the pandemic uh, would be actually compensated or replaced with uh, alternative sources. And what we envisage in the next few months, even as we emerge from the pandemic, is the same policies where 
the effects of the pandemic, the negative effects will be nationalized. Uh, in fact, the poor will be expected to bear the brunt as governments impose austerity measures or the increased taxes to get out of the pandemic. And again, the profits that have been made either from the banks or from different sectors will be privatized. So we are likely to see an increase in protests as we emerge out of the pandemic because there's lack of consultations, but also because all the negative economic effects of the pandemic will be passed down to the poor and the marginalized in the form of taxes, uh, in the form of other you know, stringent austerity measures and while the rich continue to, um, you know, to live the lives that they live. So that's really significant and it's a very good question because we experienced that uh, or we, 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 that was our experience across nations in Africa and different parts of the world. Thank you very much, uh, David. And I see uh, Ines has uh, posted the report in the chat bar. Those that want to access it, there's a link in the chat bar. I think another question is the SA constitution talks about an inclusive society. How can civil society compel government to consult more with citizens in an inclusive way as envisioned by the constitution? And while we are on that question, uh, David, you also spoke, up, you spoke about inequalities in civil movements, uh, where you mentioned that black movements were harshly handled compared to others. Is this a growing trend from your observations? And is civil society responding to this a trend where Blacks are marginalized or it's something that you know, is not yet uh, debated about? I think the point I was trying to make was that in the South African context, when you looked at protests that happened, protests that were led largely by Blacks, Black communities, faced harsher restrictions than those that were uh, predominantly white led. And so in the midst of uh, protest against police brutality, against uh, the injustices of colonialism, you see, a, we saw a repetition of uh, different tactics being used to um, counter the rights to peaceful assembly. So protests that were against you know, inequality, protests that were led by largely Black groups or Black individuals, they, they faced harsher restrictions, more violence, more stringent tactics used by police in South Africa, as opposed to uh, white-led protests that talked about, um, you know, we want to go back to the beaches, want to go back to the seaside and things like that. So that kind of discrimination became apparent even in the midst of protest against um, uh, you know, that called for, you know, the rights of Blacks predominantly. Uh, I think I see Colleen is making a, a, a good point about the community action networks. And uh, I don't know if it's Colleen from, um, from Cape Town, um, but, you know, Civicus with the affinity group of national associations um, and, 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 um, other groups, you know, did extensive surveys on what role community action networks and civil society and even individuals played in um, meeting the needs of communities when governments refused or were not able to meet these needs. And we also have research. Oh, okay, Colleen from ex -Capsa. Oh, I see. Thanks, Colleen. Uh, so we, we we did extensive surveys on what community networks and, and civil society and, and ordinary people did across the continent, across the world. And there are some very useful examples or cases where it was communities that provided services, knowledge, PPEs, basic necessities to others during the, the, the pandemic. In the Eastern Cape, uh, the there were many community-led groups that went to, uh, you know, villages on a door-to-door -door basis explaining what the pandemic is about. So if you like, we can share uh, similar reports that speak about the role of community networks uh, in mobilizing emergency relief, in uh, ensuring that people became aware of what this pandemic is and how 
they could prevent themselves from, from, from the pandemic. And again, the counter side to that was in certain countries, while they did that, they faced some restrictions from the government. But that, uh, like I said, there are other reports from Civicus that really speak about what role. And what we are saying is that given the closeness of some of these community networks to the population, it would be interesting to see how governments can consult with them and, and give them some of the responsibilities in the formal structures so that they can continue to provide emergency relief, but also can continue to contribute to policies that will aim to improve the economic status of communities as we gradually emerge out of the pandemic, whenever that will be. Well, thank you very much, David. I think you should also look at Kugel's question on the AC constitution. Uh, while Shona is asking a question, because then I can see she has raised her hand. I'll recognize Shona first, and then after, Colleen can, uh, can also raise uh, her question. Thanks so much, Andres. I just wanted to respond to Colleen's comment. Sorry, I think that possibly I wasn't very clear enough. She's quite right. Um, the community action networks were about um, mobilizing emergency relief, but my comment was in the context of activists that I spoke to from Kailicha and Guguletu, who are part of community-based organizations there. And they were talking about how the smaller community-based organizations or community networks had absorbed the work of larger organizations, such as the more professionalized NGOs during the pandemic, because they are embedded within communities. So they didn't social distance from communities. They didn't work remotely. Their lives continued and they are existing informal networks in those areas and they they felt that some of these um, community action networks that sprung up in response to COVID who, who actually did very good work and there's proof of that as David says um, were in a way I think the term that was used was why should we why should we now resort to these middle class community action networks when we have exi existing social networks because you know for for people who are privileged or for people who enjoy more privilege than others um, coronavirus pandemic was a crisis, but we face crisis every day of our lives. There's many times we haven't eaten. There's many times that we don't have access to health. There are many times when we've been ev evicted. So there was just a sense that, uh, you know, and, and I, do, I do think that they acknowledge it was just a difficult time. It was a kind of crisis emergency time. But the fact is that there are existing community networks that are not necessarily these community action networks that sprung up in response to the pandemic, but there are existing networks that could have been used in better ways at the time of a crisis. Um, in fact, they should have been used in better ways. And that was the point that I was trying to make. So I hope that I've been a bit clearer now, but Colleen's got her hands up, so I would love to hear what she says. Thanks, Colleen, for engaging. Can I go, Chair? Yes, Colleen, you can ask your question. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think this whole thing of the cans is something that really should be... Um, researched and understood. I think there's amazing learning and amazing work um, and also a lot of mistakes. Um, and I also, because I've been working with some of the cans here in Johannesburg and they um, evolved in a very different way to the ones in Cape Town. And here in Johannesburg, Gauteng, there was some middle class, uh, there, there are some that are middle class led and there were a lot and still are that are community stroke township based. Um, but one of the things that has frustrated me personally, given my, my work experience and the advocacy activism that I've been involved in in the past is I've been frustrated that um, while in Cape Town there does seem to be advocacy going on now, 
um, and different kinds of civil society partnerships around food security and food sovereignty at a systemic level. Um, that hasn't been able to happen in Johannesburg so far. And I just feel frustrated about that. So, yeah, so that's kind of my, my own particular interest around this. Thank you very much for your input. David, do you want to add on to that or you, Ennis? Um, maybe Ines, but uh, Kogan's uh, point about how to ensure that um, a civil society, the government consults um, extensively or consults with more with citizens in an inclusive way. I think that's the, the big question we've been confronting uh, for, for many years uh, because the constitution is there, very clear for all to see with, um, with very uh, progressive uh, principles uh, as, as we have with, you know, many of the international and regional frameworks that the South African government, like uh, many other African governments have, um, you know, either adhered to or promulgated. But when it comes to practice, I think we generally seen, you know, um, half-hearted consultations during elections. And, and after that, the next time communities or citizens see the government again is, uh, when, when, when the next elections are around the corner. So, uh, and, and that's the reason why you've seen a lot of protests because those formal structures that the con our constitutions um, have put in place where there should be enough consultations with citizens uh, on any issue affecting citizens, those formal structures have been bypassed by governments uh, the state institutions are not doing what they are supposed to do. And that's why you see citizens now using the only avenue uh, to raise concerns about issues that, um, you know, affect them. I don't think there's a single politician represented in government that does not understand the day-to-day -day challenges of uh, ordinary South Africans or ordinary Africans across the continent. There's just a general lack of political will uh, and it's a big, it's a huge question that maybe as civil society, we need to look at ways in which we force the government to, uh, to consult more with citizens uh, beyond what they are doing now. Um, and, and it's something that maybe we can, we can really take time to, to discuss, but so far it's not happening the way the constitution states. No, thank you very much, uh, but David. I see we are a bit over time, so I'll give you three minutes or so to respond to the questions that we have. I don't know if, Angela, you want to ask your question, because then you said, what about education, formal, informal, the role of citizens in this? Uh, maybe you can unmute and uh, elaborate on your question. But then while you are unmuting, uh, there's a question for both Ines and David that, well, we've seen that you know, international movements like Black Lives Matter have gained dominance across the world. Uh, is, is there a trend where local, like in, uh, movements from third world countries, are they getting the same attention as those from international, uh, from the international world? Angela, you can ask your question. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think when, when we speak about civil society and we, we look at the various actions that are taking place, one of the um, real needs, I wouldn't say need, but one of the desires is really to look at how are we educating our youth and not just our youth, but all, all our young children to be... I don't know if it's about being resilient, but really to, to be activists within their communities and, and activists for quality education. So when we speak about the SDGs and, and yeah, the SDGs are not for all Africans either, you know, because it, it's, it's just too much that it actually, that it actually asks for. 
but but how can we work with our particular context and enhancement of all our citizens, especially our children? Thank you. No, thank you very much, Angela. I don't know, uh, in so David, and uh, maybe one of you can answer to that question. Okay, uh, yeah, let, let me start with your question about the uh, movements from the global south, which is uh, actually, I, I like the question, is quite, quite challenging and interesting. Um, I think, you know, at, up, up to some point, uh, yes, uh, some of the, um, the struggles uh, that have made an impact and, and made headlines of, in the long term over the past few years have come from the global south. And uh, some of them, uh, I mean, in my region, which is the, the one I know best, so I'm, not, I'm going to speak about that, not because it's the most important, but it's because I know more about it. But, you know, from Latin America, we've seen uh, movements uh, for um, indigenous movements um, um, actually becoming, uh, becoming, you know, global. And, and also specifically, very particularly, uh, women's rights movements. Uh, again, you know, the movement against uh, violence against women and femicide. Uh, not, not only the movement themselves and, and the discourse and, and the framing of the issues, but even some performances and, and more forms of protest that became viral and, and, and all over the world and were imitated that came from, from, from some Latin American countries. So, um, I mean, that was not what happened, of course, in the case of the struggle for uh, uh, racial justice, uh, which uh, came from from the US. Um, so, um, I, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, I, I think, because um, this actually pointed to the fault lines in, 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 a, in, a, in a society that calls itself democratic and an example for the world. So the fact that, you know, that lack of democracy, that exclusion, um, uh, from the country that considers, you know, itself the, the sort of the example for democracy that tries to export uh, throughout the world. That, that, it's good that that movement came from there, but it's also interesting to see how it was adopted, because uh, movements uh, in the global south that were uh, long ongoing uh, in many countries, they took advantage of that uh, visibility, uh, you know, that 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 the, and 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 it helped them uh, sort of highlight and bring up their struggles, which were, you know, more low profile or, or less visible and became more um, more relevant uh, when they sort of mounted on the wave of Black Lives Matter. So it, I don't think it's it's negative that, that that you know that it's a movement from the global north that uh, in a way it expresses the fact that uh, there's a south within the north as well. So yeah, I, I don't know, David. Would you like to add and as well answer to Angela's uh, uh, question? I think it's a very useful point, and I I wish I knew the answer to to that. You know. How can we empower activists from, um, you know, the school level? There are many individual activists doing what they can at school, but I think for those of us with uh, within international, national, and regional civil society groups, we have to make better connections with these individual activists. We have to move beyond working across themes, working across uh, objectives that speak to what our donors want to really uh you know reach out to grassroots from the schools to our communities support those who need to be supported raise the profiles of those who need to be raised uh and and it's something that you know how we go about doing that we may not have all the answers but it's a useful uh, conversation that we need to have some of us got into activism activism from um you know when we're at school and we're isolated and, and sometimes there was no support and everything depended then on the individual effort and the resources. And even sometimes at the expense of the advice of parents who asked us to stop doing that. But now that we are where we are, we should look back and support those who are actually leading um, campaigns at school level, whether it's on climate issues or inequality, or just to ensure that our young daughters and, and girls get access to sanitary, uh, you know, resources that they need to be able to go to school on a daily basis. I think we need to reimagine how we do activism and look at where we can build um, 
you know, activists that will take this from, from their schools, you know, to parliament. But we don't have all the answers and we hope that we can have further conversations as civil society in the future on how we prioritize activism in schools. Yeah, yeah no, thank you very much. Uh, I'll give you uh, both about 45 seconds to close for us if you have any um, remarks that you'd want to make as well also highlight on because there's well there was a question on uh, vaccine inequalities will we see uh, um, a response to this by civil society maybe you can answer that and as well uh, put in your final remarks Ines you want to go first okay all right let me go um, I think for me Andres whether it's vaccine inequality or activism for human rights, for political participation, for economic and social rights, the time has come for us to reconnect with those who really matter. And those are the people on the ground. Uh, the people who led some of the largest protests in the midst of the pandemic late last year and early this year in India were farmers. So they are not your formal human rights defenders that we continue to work with who know the systems who know the doors they can knock on in parliament they are farmers they are fishermen they are school children uh, they are community leaders so we really need to reconnect with our communities with people who are at the um, forefront of the inequalities and the economic decisions that affect them negatively i also think we need to take a step back sometimes and celebrate the wins that you know you see from civil society the provision of humanitarian assistance in the midst of the pandemic the democratic gains in countries like malawi uh, and the what we may call you know the pieces of legislation that advance human rights and the rights of individuals if we can learn from those wins then we can build on them so that five years down the line we're not having protests again in a country like malawi to call for another election so let's celebrate our wins and see how we can spread the wins as far as possible but thank you so much for this opportunity ines Okay, so yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you've said. So let me just add one thing. Uh, I think uh, definitely um, uh, we need to focus on supporting those uh, on the forefront, uh, those at the grassroots level and those who are actually affecting change. Uh, so we need to focus on the right to freedom of, uh, of peaceful assembly um, because uh, the conditions for protest need to, meet, to be made, uh, met uh, because protest uh, works. A protest actually works and um, this doesn't mean of course that protesters always get everything that they want because they rarely do but it means that everything worthy that we have achieved as civil society over the past decades actually was born out of that pressure a street pressure protest mobilization um, so of course civil society doesn't only protest we do a lot of other things uh, civil society has expertise civil society uh, needs a seat at the table in the policy making process but how do we get uh, uh, that seat at the table I mean, the one question here was how, I mean, how we make sure that we are, that people are consulted. I mean, how, how we do that? I mean, we, it's, it's the pressure that always wins us that seat at the table. So uh, we really need to focus on, uh, on assembly rights and make sure that um, uh, next time uh, uh, people want to come out in, in huge numbers to put pressure on elected authorities or, or non-elected authorities, uh, authoritarian governments as well, uh, we, they, the, the conditions are met so uh, they, uh, they can do it. Uh, the right of peaceful assembly is respected and defended so people can um, mobilize in great numbers and demand change. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Ines, and thank you very much to you, David. Uh, we really appreciate the time that you have made to give us this insightful presentation. We'll certainly read the document and share it amongst our networks. Um, and once again, thank you very much to everyone else that came and joined us today. Uh, it was really great. Shona, I don't know if you have any final remarks Thanks so much, Andres. I don't have any remarks. I just want to thank everyone, especially the speakers and everyone who participated. I think there's so much to discuss here. We could be here all evening. But I just want to invite you guys to the next seminar in this series. So we are engaging again with our civicist colleagues next Wednesday. 
and we're going to be talking about another report, Solidarity in the Time of COVID, um, these are the civil society responses to the pandemic, and the speaker is Andrew Furman. So same time, same platform, please join us again for another discussion. And thank you so much, Ines and David, and I'm so thrilled to be in contact with you, and I hope that we can keep uh, an open line of communication, because I think we have a lot to talk about. Thank you, Andres and Danford, for doing such a lovely job of the facilitation, and keep safe, everyone. Thank you all. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.